So today is a kind of a big deal in chemistry because it's the first time we're looking at the periodic table. And if we were together, I would do a big drum roll and say, wow, this is so exciting. You're all going to get your very own copy. So if you do have access to a printer at home, um, you will want to print yourself a copy of the periodic table because you're going to be using it quite a bit this year. And you can find that on our main Schoology page all the way at the top because we use it so often. I like to make it readily accessible for you. Um, one of the big questions I get asked when I pass out the periodic table is someone always asks, are we going to have to memorize this? And the answer is absolutely not. Um, the periodic table is a wealth of information. There's lots of symbols and numbers and the elements are organized in a particular way. And during the course of the year, we're going to learn about why it is the way it is. Um, but there's no secrets on the periodic table. And when you are finally able to come into our classroom, you'll see that there's a big periodic table hanging up on the wall. And I'm never going to hide that from you. It'll never be covered with a big bed sheet or something. Um, so you need to use our periodic table a lot, you do not have to memorize anything off of it. A lot of things will just kind of end up in your brain anyway, just from using it, but you'll never be required to memorize any information off of that periodic table. So what we're going to look at today is how you can tie together the periodic table and information about what the structure of an atom looks like. So um, what we're going to be looking at, like this says, how do we use the periodic table to determine the amount of subatomic particles? The subatomic particles are those little particles that make up individual atoms that I know you guys have all heard of before. Um, so it mentions here that all atoms are composed of a nucleus, where the protons and neutrons are, and electrons revolving around that nucleus. So the electrons are your negatively charged particle. And we can find those guys in what we call electron clouds. A lot of people think of the atom as being a two-dimensional object, almost like a the nucleus is in the center, like the sun, and then that the electrons zip around it, kind of like planets around the sun. Um, that is a model of what we used to think the atom looks like, but it's actually more of a three-dimensional model, as you guys are going to see throughout the year, that those electrons do not move like rings around the sun. Instead, it's three-dimensional space. So it's almost more like... Um, that candy, an everlasting gobstopper. The center of an everlasting gobstopper is the nucleus, but it has layers of uh, candy on top of it. And that those candy layers go in all three directions, right? Top, bottom, left, right. Um, or kind of like a jelly donut. The jelly is the nucleus, but the donut surrounds it in all, all directions. Those are your electron clouds. Uh, then we have the proton, which is your positively charged particle. And that guy is found in the nucleus in the center. The proton number is unique and special because it tells you what type of atom you're talking about in that particular problem. As you'll see in just a second, that... If you have an atom of hydrogen, for example, all atoms of hydrogen always have the same number of protons. That's how you can tell that it's an atom of hydrogen. Or all helium atoms have the same number of protons. All oxygen atoms have the same number of protons. So just by proton number alone, you can figure out what type of atom you have off the periodic table there. And then the neutron, just like it sounds, is the neutral particle, also found in the nucleus. And the job of those neutrons is to help spread out the protons. If it was just protons in the nucleus, since the protons are all positively charged, if you were to bring one positively charged particle next to another positively charged particle, 
these guys would repel one another. And if the nucleus was solely made up of protons, the nuclei would probably explode. All, you wouldn't be able to jam all those positively charged particles so close to one another. So instead, what that nucleus looks like is we have those positive protons, but we also have neutrons that kind of get in the middle of those protons and help spread out all that positive charge. So if you want to figure out the number of particles present in an atom, we're going to look at a couple rules for protons and electrons, and then we're going to get to neutrons in just a second. Uh, so the proton number in the nucleus is always, 100% of the time, equal to the atomic number of the element. So I gave you a little sample periodic table square down below there. So this whole number that you see at the top of each periodic table square, that is what we call the element's atomic number. And that's going to tell us how many protons that particular element has. So all atoms of carbon have six protons. If I were to scroll up here and we look at another element here, if I said, tell me about gold, right here, gold has 79 protons. Or if I said, tell me which element on the periodic table has 35 protons. You could look at the, find it on the periodic table and you'd say, oh, that would be bromine. So atomic number will tell us number of protons. The number of electrons in your atom is usually going to be equal to the number of protons, since the positive and negative charges usually balance out so the atom can be neutral. An important idea to know in this class is that all matter around you is electrically neutral. Meaning, the amount of positive particles in that substance equals the number of negative particles in that substance. The positives and negatives always balance. And so what do I mean by that? Um, if you look around your room right now, maybe you have your iPad sitting in front of you or a calculator or um, a pencil some paper, something like that. If you look around the objects of your room, um, that pencil and the calculator, for example, if the calculator was negative and the paper was positive, they would attract one another, right? But you've never seen your calculator just jump up and start walking across your desk and land on top of the piece of paper. If you did, that would be really strange, right? It's because matter is always neutral. So the amount of protons and electrons within your piece of paper are equal to one another. The amount of protons and the electrons inside your calculator are equal to one another. So the calculator is not attracted to the piece of paper. It's also not repelled by that piece of paper. So everything around you that you see is neutral. That's not the case if you have an ion. And we'll see more about ions in just a little bit. 